Uh, the rest of you guys, everyone, can go to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis 12. <clears throat> it's right at the beginning. Okay, you guys like road trips? Um, there's two types of road trips, okay? First trip is when the destination is the point. So twice a year, since I was a little kid, my family would drive to Philadelphia to visit family. And on those road trips, the destination was the point. 18 hours in an Astro van. You guys remember Astro vans? Oh, yeah. I wish I could forget. <laughs> Bathroom breaks took place on the side of I-95. Um, we only stopped for gas. Don't ask for snacks. Don't ask for drinks. Don't get out of the car. Don't look at those food signs that come up and tell you the restaurants because we weren't going to stop for food. Um, don't look at billboards. Don't look at anything. And don't talk. <laughs> um, now I take my family to New Jersey. We're going to be going in a few weeks. And uh, I follow in my father's footsteps. You know, Because uh, on those trips, the destination is the point. You have to get where you're going. Uh, but then there are the other types of road trips where the destination is not really the point. The journey is the point. So you're not in a hurry. You'll get where you're going when you get there. So, uh, you know, the world's biggest ball of yarn, let's pull off the road and, and check it out. You know, Katie and I, well, we went to Ireland when we first got married, and that's what it did. We drove the whole week, and, uh, you know, oh, that's a nice cliff. Let's stop there. Oh, look at that little trail. Let's find out what's there. You know, hey, let's try this. It was great. The journey was the point. Um, those two types of trips. How many of you guys are on the uh, destination is the point? Anybody? Tim, I figured. When you go to West Virginia, you just go, right? Yeah, you don't even have to stop because you got the, the fifth wheel. Yeah, wow. But uh, how many of you guys have been on the other sides? The journey. Yeah, easy. Okay, everybody else? You guys have some joy still in your life? That's good. Um, what are you all right. What? I don't know. Hey, I'm on your side. I'm, I'm the destination. They have joy in their life. We have joy when the trip's over. Good. Um, so why did I say that? Well, Abraham's on a trip. Last week, he started in Ur. God called him. He moved a little bit. And then he waited, and then after his dad died, he moved the rest of the way. And he didn't go the right way, he, he took Lot with him. But when he got to Canaan, God says, hey, you're here, and the promise still stands. I'm going to give all this to you. Okay, trip's over, right? But he still doesn't have a kid. Uh, there's still other people living here. Um, he's still a, a traveling Bedouin. He's still a wandering Aramean. And uh, although he has the promise, nothing's been delivered. Um, here's one of the things you have to understand about faith, okay? Um, one of the main things we'll pick up in the life of Abraham is that faith is about the journey. It's not about the destination. Okay? Abraham was not just called to a place. He was called to a person. Canaan, the land of Canaan, was not the, the holder of his hope. God was. He wasn't trusting in Canaan. He had to trust in God. And he was called to follow him. Now, God's going to keep his word and fulfill all of his promises, but not yet. Because the thing about faith is that in the journey of faith, God changes us into who he wants us to be. It's not so much about where Abraham ends up. It's about who God turns him into along the way. And our lives of faith are no different. When we get saved, we don't get zapped up into heaven. We don't. When we get saved, we don't automatically become perfect. Right? Some of you may think that. You don't. Heaven's not the point. We're not called to a place. We're called to a person. We're called to Jesus Christ himself. So we walk with him by faith, and as we take that walk with him, he changes us into who he wants us to be. The journey is the point. So Abraham's journey is just beginning. Let's pick it up. Chapter 12, verse 5. <clears throat> it says, Abraham took Sarai, his wife, Lot, his nephew, and all their possessions which they had accumulated, and the persons which they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan. And they came to the land of Canaan. Abram passed through the land as far as the site of Shechem to the oak of Morah. Now the Canaanite was then in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. 
So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. So Abraham shows up. God says, hey, this is the place that I showed you. Here it is. It's yours. I hope you like it. And Abraham built an altar. This altar would be a memorial of worship to Yahweh. He, gives, he would perform a sacrifice to Yahweh as this act of worship. This is probably a new thing for Abram. Because as we learned from what Joshua said, that him and his parents, they, they served other gods. So he's just getting to know Yahweh. Now he builds him an altar and he worships there. Because God is so gracious. And even though his faith was little, his faith was cautious, his faith was late, he got where he was supposed to go, and then God says, hey, you're here. Now, let's read verse 8. <clears throat> then... He proceeded from there to the mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. So he goes a little bit further south. He builds another altar to worship. And here he calls upon the name of the Lord. Hope that phrase sounds important or familiar. Um, what that means is that he expresses a personal faith in Yahweh. He invokes Yahweh's name in worship. He ain't saying, I worship you, God. He's saying, I trust you, Yahweh. Calls upon the name of the Lord. The first time this is mentioned is in Genesis 5. I'll read it for you. Adam had relations with his wife again. She gave birth to a son and named him Seth. For she said, God has appointed me another offspring in place of Abel, for Cain killed Abel. To Seth was also born a son named Enosh. Then, Men began to call upon the name of the Lord. So what we hear is this little thing that in Seth's descendants, some of these men began to call upon the name of the Lord. That's the first time that phrase is mentioned. The second time is right here with Abraham. But it continues throughout the rest of the Bible. In Joel 2.32, Joel writes, Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Paul said it in Romans 10.13, Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Peter preached it in his first sermon in Acts 2.21. He says, for anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. In 1 Corinthians 1.2, Paul describes Christians as all believers, those who have called upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, later, Genesis 26, spoiler alert, Abraham does have a son named Isaac. Isaac builds an altar and calls upon the name of the Lord. So this is a big deal. Um, what I want you to think of this as Abraham's mountaintop spiritual experience. He's in the land, his faith is strong, and he says, Lord, I it took me a while to get here, I know, but I'm here now. I'm here, I'm following you, I trust in you, I believe, Lord, I believe you're going to do everything you say you're going to do, I worship you, you are my God, I am your servant, I'm sold in, I'm all in with you, this is it. Expression of faith. Now, Mike Tyson said everyone's got a plan until they get hit. When I was in fourth grade, homecoming night, I was in front of my school wrestling people. I was wrestling kids my age, and I was winning. I beat kid number one, pinned him down, hopped back up. Beat kid number two, I thought I was on fire. I don't know what it was. Whenever they grabbed me, I could slither out. I was winning. I thought I was unbeatable. And then this guy showed up named Greg White. He was four years older than me. He was about twice my size, and he's like, I'll wrestle you. And I said, come on, man. You remember him? I'll take you on. It's a true story. Within seconds, he was on the ground with his feet straight up, and I was on top of his feet flailing. He wiggled out from under me. I fell and snapped my arm right in two. Broke it. Okay? Um, he told me, your arm's not broken. And I held it up, and I remember that it was bowed. <laughs> crying, crying, crying. This is the thing. Whenever you think you're on top, there's always a Greg White. <laughs> He's going to come. Um, Paul in, in 1 Corinthians says, He that thinks he stand, watch out, lest he fall. Um, Abraham is at this moment of triumph. He's in the land. Everything's great. And then the famine starts. Look at verse 9. Abraham journeyed on, continuing toward the Negev. Now there was a famine in the land. So Abraham went down to Egypt. Okay. When he goes south to the Negev, he begins to get into this desert area, wilderness. Um, it's not fertile. Abraham grew up in the Fertile Crescent. Okay, if you think of a half moon, he started on this side, went up, bend over, 
And then he got to the other side and kept going. And now it's not so fertile anymore. And to make matters worse, it's a little extra arid because there's a famine. Now, last week I told you that faith is a response to something God said. And I told you that faith is a process because it can't be divorced from everything else in life. There will be things that challenge our faith. And we have to respond to these challenges as well. Think of them as wrestling matches. <clears throat> the only way for our faith to grow is to wrestle with these things. Through friction of life. You can't learn to trust God when times are easy. So one of the main, well the first thing in Abraham's life, and one of the main things in our life that we have to wrestle with is fear. Faith must wrestle with fear. Abram goes from the mountaintop of faith to the valley of fear. He is down south in what's basically a desert, and a famine hits. Now, in a famine, water becomes scarce. Food becomes scarce. Prices go up, and the grass dies. And for a man like Abraham, who is basically a shepherd, grass matters. Water matters. Not only does he have to feed his family, but if he starts losing sheep and losing oxen because there's not enough to, to support them all, he also loses money. For a man like him, tied to the land, famines are terrible. Um, so he decides to move on. Now we see that there's no altar here he builds. He goes on his own. And he looks south and goes to Egypt. Says to sojourn there, for the famine was severe in the lands. Now, Abraham wasn't moved by God this time. He was moved by his own fear. You, you know, we can't judge him because, you know, we've been there. He can see the famine. He can't see the promise, right? He can see his animals get weak. He can see the fact that there's not a lot of water. He can feel that heat. He can feel that hunger. He can't touch the promises. So he takes matters into his own hands. And he goes south. So, just want to say, you know, we live in America. We maybe probably haven't gone through a big famine like that. Although, you know, gas is up pretty high right now and everything else is up. And maybe that is a famine in your life right now. But we do go through all types of famines. You know, how about emotional famines? You know, we go through seasons where we feel depressed and we don't know why. We go through seasons of sadness, maybe because people we love have died or, or left us or or rejected us and walked out. You know, we go through abandonment. I know many of you guys have, have been through this. We, we've all lost loved ones. These emotional famines can hit hard. And we don't see them coming a lot of times. I don't know if you guys have been there. You just feel like things aren't going your way. And you don't know when they'll start going your way. And every day feels like a struggle. And during those famines, like Abraham, we're forced or we're tempted to find a way to fix the problem on our own. And we're moved by our fear and not by God. And so people find these quick fixes and man-made solutions. You know, some people seek instant gratification. Some people seek to do whatever they can to bury the hurt or to ignore that pain. Uh, Whatever is necessary to cover up the feelings. You know, people can turn to drugs. People can turn to alcohol. People can turn to unhealthy sexual lifestyles. People can turn to becoming a slave to what other people think about them and doing whatever it takes to get some type of approval by these people in their lives. And none of these solutions mean anything. They don't, they don't come from God, but we try to fix things ourselves. And then the harder we try, usually what happens is we wind up further in the desert. There's spiritual famines too. Sometimes you just feel like your well is run dry. The Lord seems distant, and you don't know why. You, know, you can lose your sense of joy, you can lose your sense of peace, and feel like you are in this wilderness. Um, and in these moments, you know, we're driven to take matters into our own hands. And people do. People turn to mysticism. You know, the, the, they buy some weird book by some weird spiritual guru, and, and they, they combine biblical Christianity with like Eastern mysticism and they start thinking that, you know, rote repetition will fix the problem or 
you know, buying incense and candles and having a seance will fix the problem, or going through Eastern forms of meditation will fix the problem. And we get all this weird stuff into Christianity, and none of it comes from Scripture. It all comes from something else, and it just helps us feel more spiritual. Some people turn to spiritism. You know, you want answers, and you're not getting them. You want to see something that's real. So, so you end up, you know, I, I know of Christians who go to card readers, or they go to psychics, or they begin to dabble in these other things, and they just want something spiritual. And, you know, what these things do, you know, spiritism, it forces God to answer you. That's what it is. It's you taking control of the spirit world and forcing him to give you answers. It's the opposite of biblical Christianity. The most common thing people turn to, though, in spiritual famines is legalism. Because it's much easier to formulate a set of rules that you follow to look spiritual than it is to have an actual relationship with the living God. A relationship that begins to be founded on rules is not founded on faith. And then you begin to judge your spirituality and closeness with the Lord, not by faith, but by how good you're doing with the rules you make. It's legalism. We go through financial famines, bills, debt, and the cash is low. And we can surrender to worry and anxiety and fear and hopelessness that will never get out of these hard times. Some are driven to shut down the generosity, fix the problem with unethical practices, cutting corners, or moving from a place you knew God had you to a place where He is not sending you. There are lots of types of famines. Not all are these physical things. <laughs> Here's the truth, though. Famines don't have to turn you from God. They can drive you to God. There are many Christians who turn from God when they go through famines like this, but they don't have to. You know, in hard financial times, God can teach us dependence. He can teach us contentment. He can teach us gratitude for the things we do have. Some of the times in my life when I've learned to be grateful for what I do have is when I've lost other things. We can learn to faithfully trust God as our provider. We'll never learn those things when times are good. In times of emotional famine, we can learn to be dependent on God, to have our fellowship from Him. Learn how to find joy in Christ. Learn how to lean on that hope in Christ. You know, you don't learn to lean on Christ until you need somebody to lean on. God can use these famines to teach us and to mold us and to change us. But if we immediately take matters into our own hands, we don't learn anything. And spiritual famines, you can learn what it means to wait on the Lord. Learn what it means to value His presence. And to notice where he's working and moving. Learn what it means, like David says, to thirst for the Lord. God says, you'll find me if you seek me with all your hearts. If we always feel like he's right here and everything's perfect, we'll never have a sense that we need him. And that we should seek for him with everything in us. Sometimes God has to feel hard to find. Famines can grow our faith or they can reveal the weakness of our faith. And we find now that Abraham's got some weaknesses. Big time. Look at verse 11. He's on his way to Egypt. Now, I will just say this. Going to Egypt isn't necessarily a sin. We know that he wasn't being driven by God. But God didn't tell him not to go. He didn't tell him to stay. He's wandering. But what he does is the problem. Look at verse 11. It came about that when he came near to Egypt, that he said to Sarai, his wife, See now, I know that you're a beautiful woman. All right, so if your husband ever starts to uh, compliment you, He's about to say something stupid, right? <laughs> and when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will let you live. Okay, verse 13. Please say that you're my sister, so that it may go well with me because of you, and that I may live on account of you. Abraham's fear gave way to self-preservation. His motives are selfish. They're all about himself. Read it. Hey, it'll go good with me if you do this. I'll live if you do this. If you don't do this, I'm going to die, and you'll get to live. His motives are selfish. He's willing to lie to save his own skin. More than that, he's willing to sacrifice Sarah for his own safety and well-being. 
Fear turned Abraham into a coward. Fear makes us look at our problems. The famines, the dangers, what could go wrong. And fear turns people into cowards. Remember Peter? He just said, Peter, you're going to deny me. Uh-uh, not me. I'll die for you. They'll deny you, not me. What happened the same very night? I don't know him. I don't know him. I don't know him. Fear turned him into a coward. But, you know, faith has the power to make us valid. You know, Jonathan and his armor bearer, if you guys remember the story, Saul was sitting under the tree, afraid to do anything. The Philistines were in the land. Jonathan and his armor bearer, they had one sword, two guys. And they said, hey, let's go start a fight. This is what he says. Perhaps the Lord will work for us. For the Lord's not restrained to save by many or by few. You see, he wasn't looking at the numbers. He looked at God. David, and a few chapters over, we know little David faced the giant. What did he say? He says, I'm here so that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not deliver by sword or by spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. You see, faith. Neither of these guys trusted in their own sword play. They trusted in God. Think about Elisha, when he and his servant were surrounded by the enemy, and his servant was freaking out, and he says, don't fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Fear turns us into cowards. And we do cowardly things in our fear, and our wanting to preserve our own lives. We turn into selfishness. <clears throat> but faith can make us valiant, bold as a lion. Fear looks at the problems, but faith looks at the God that's bigger than our problems. Bigger than the famine. Bigger than whatever drives our fear. And I hope you know that God is bigger than whatever you're afraid of. You know, my kids get scared all the time, right? Finn, when he gets scared of something under the bed, when he gets scared of something in the closet, he doesn't just stay in bed. He doesn't. He also doesn't run into that closet to check on whatever's in there. <laughs> he wakes me up, <laughs> which is fine. And then I go in there, and you know what I do? I don't care what's in the closet. I open the closet and I look. It ain't no big thing for me. He's scared. And he has learned to run to me. And I fight these little battles. I'm not afraid to stick my head under the bed. If something ever is there, I'm done for. I'm never prepared for it. He says these things. You know, we're just like little children. We get scared of everything. Oh, we get so scared. How is God going to pay this bill? Oh, my goodness. How is God going to provide this? Oh my goodness, how is God going to take me out of this? I'm so scared, I'm so scared. And then we do one of two things. Either we wallow in it, like a kid who's afraid of the dark and just wallows in the bed without coming to his dad's room. We do that. Oh no, I wish somebody was out there who could help me. Or we take matters in our own hands. And we go through these struggles and struggles and struggles. When if we would just run to our father, it ain't no big deal for him. He's not afraid of what's in our closets. He's bigger than all those things. So Abraham's got this famine. And I'll tell you, because we're going to find out the famine's there for a reason. But he doesn't learn anything from the famine. He runs, runs, turns into a coward, sacrifices his wife, gets down there. All right, 14 through 16. So, it came about when Abram came into Egypt. Of course, the Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful. Pharaoh's officials saw her and praised her to Pharaoh, and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. Therefore, he traded Abram well for her sake and gave him sheep and oxen and donkeys and male and female servants and female donkeys and camels. So his fear led to self-preservation. Self-preservation moved him to sacrifice the well-being of his wife. And what happened? Sarah's taken. Just imagine for a second Abraham standing at the door of his tent watching Sarah get taken away. Can you picture that? Maybe he kept his eyes on the ground. Maybe he watched her take taken away. What was going through his mind? Maybe he was thinking, well, God made the promise to me, not to her. She's expendable. I'm not. You know, they haven't had kids and they're getting old. Maybe he thought there's no danger in her having kids over there because it's her fault. You see, he's not the hero of this story. Now think about Sarah. What was she thinking? You know, she followed her husband to this strange land. She believed in him, trusting in his faith. And now he lets her go. 
You know, the compromises we make in fear, they don't just affect us. They don't just hurt us. Especially men. You know, the, the, the decisions we make when we're driven by fear affects our spouses, affects our children, affects our legacy. You know, we all have these circles around us, and none of us have a circle just around us. Our circles are big, and they affect other people, and our decisions affect these people. Abraham made all these decisions, and the thing that I'm so mad about, and the thing that oftentimes we find out when we do take things in our head, it worked. <laughs> He's treated well. He's living the high life. He's getting camels. Can you know, imagine that? Pharaoh's like, man, you know, she doesn't have a dad. She's got a brother. So I'm just going to shower him with all these amazing things because he let me have a sister. This is awesome. Oh, send that, you know, send that pack of camels over to Abraham. Abraham's like, okay, cool, you know. Portfolio is just going up, going up. Everything's great for him. Meanwhile, Sarah, she's just been added to some harem with all these other girls. Just traded like cattle for more stuff. You know, we're always taught Abraham, this great man of God, but he went from this mountaintop of faith to trading his wife in for some animals so that he can live. <clears throat> he puts everything on the line for his own safety. All right. Verse 17. But the Lord. Let me tell you something. Okay? This is where the, the takes a turn. Um, a lot of times in Scripture it says something, 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 but God. And those are some of my favorite verses in Scripture. You know, I think of Romans 5. It says, you know, who will die for a righteous man? Maybe, maybe for a good man, somebody out there would just dare to die, but God, right? But God showed us his love and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now, I think of Ephesians. We were dead in our trespasses and sin. Oh, man, in the ways of the world that we once walked, according to the spirit of the power of the air, but God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, made us alive in Christ. I love those two words, but God. Abraham did not fight for Sarah, but God did. Verse 17, But the Lord struck Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. Then Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this you've done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she's my sister so that I took her for my wife? Now then, here is your wife. Take her and go. You know, God struck Pharaoh. Don't touch her. You know, what must have happened is his whole house broke out in some funky plague, and Sarah was the only clean one. What is, what is, why, why doesn't she sick like the rest of us? Maybe she said, well, I don't know, it might be, you know, I don't know. My, my, my husband and I were on this journey. Maybe people went to Abraham and said, what's going on? We don't know. Maybe God showed up and told him, because he's going to do this later. But Pharaoh found out, and he doesn't kill Abraham. He says, take her and go. You know, um, God, that's, that's grace. God intervened and protected Sarah. He defended her honor. He made sure nobody touched her. That is grace. He taught Abraham some things too, that she's part of the promise. That she's part of the plan. And it ain't just about him. But we can sympathize with Abraham because he was so sure beforehand. He was, sure, he was so full of faith before the famine hit. Abraham fell. And you know, it's a sad day when the world can look at someone who's following God and condemn them for something they shouldn't have done, but they did. I don't know if you've been there. But for Pharaoh, the pagan, to look at Abraham, the man of faith, and say, look at you. What did you do to me? And Abraham can't say anything. Because he did wrong. You know, he was supposed to be a blessing to the world. And he literally brought a curse. And he leaves. Now, you know the amazing thing is when he leaves, what does he do? The Bible doesn't say the famine's gone. In fact, we know it's still around because in the next chapter, he's going to start fighting over water with Lot. He still had to face the famine. All those little fixes, they didn't solve the problem. They just averted it for a little while, and God in his grace takes him, and look what it does. So Abraham went up from Egypt to the Negev, he and his wife and all that belonged to him, and Lot with him. He's still there. <clears throat> Verse 2, now Abram was very rich in livestock in silver and in gold. He went on his journeys from the Negev as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Ai, to the place of the altar which he had made there formerly. And there Abraham called on the name of the Lord. You know, I love this. Faith is a journey. Abraham's first big test, he failed. Failed bad, failed hard. 
done. But God's grace, God's grace led him out of fear back to faith. God didn't wipe him out and say, that's it. He said, no, come on. The famine no longer matters. Now he knows he can trust God, right? Now he knows God will provide, God will protect him, God's got it there. So where does he go now? Well, he goes back to where he was before, to the same altar where he called on the name of the Lord, and he gets back there alone with God and says, all right, I'm back. I trust you. Okay. Grace moved him from fear to faith. I think that's beautiful. Grace teaches us that it's not about our strength and our resolve. It's about God's strength and God's resolve. It's not about the constancy of our faith. It's about the constancy of His faithfulness. So wherever you are right now, wherever you end up, fear will always try to attack your faith. You will always be tempted to not trust that God will meet that need, or that God can't change your situation, or that God won't change that person. That God can't forgive you when you fall. <clears throat> just want you to know that the things that scare you don't have to drive you away from God. They can drive you to Him. But there will be times when you won't be driven to Him. You'll be going off on your own. You're going to mess up. And when you do, you have to remember that God is faithful when we are faithless. He is faithfully gracious, especially when we don't deserve it. When I walk with my son, and we are holding hands, both of them, when they slip, they don't fall because the strength of their grip in my hand. They stay up because I'm holding on to them. It's not the strength of your grip that holds on to God. It's the strength of his grip he's holding on to you. Jesus does not say that God is placed in the palm of our hands. He says we are placed in his hand, and nothing can pluck us out of him. So, if you haven't figured it out yet, Abraham is not the hero of this story. And you're not the hero of your story. God's the hero. He's the faithful one. He's the gracious one. He's the protector. He's the provider. He's the one that calls us back like a good shepherd when we've gone astray. And he is the one who laid his life down for us when we were astray. He keeps his promises. So like Abraham, we have to learn to trust him. Let's pray. Father, we love you. And Lord, I know right now, I feel like everyone in this church feels like Abraham. We're all going through stuff. None of us know where we're headed or how things are going to be fixed or what the future holds. There are so many questions. The way ahead often seems so dark. You don't tell us everything we want to know. And you don't place ourselves, or you don't place yourself at our disposal. You make us trust you. Learn to walk by faith. So we just ask that you increase our faith. And I know that you increase our faith through difficulties. So I'm scared to even ask that. But I'm so grateful and thankful that you are a gracious God who keeps his promises. And when all else fails, we know that we can trust in that. So we love you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.